Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Uh, welcome. I feel like there's uh, a few empty seats out there. So uh, Drex's, <coughs> I guess, idea from a couple weeks ago did not come true. Um, if you would join me, I'd like to pray uh, before we jump into the sermon today. Heavenly Father, I thank you for uh, those folks that led us in worship. Um, I love them so much, and I just thank you for uh, people in their 20s who <laughs> can think of nothing better than to play music to worship you, uh, practice a couple times throughout the week, and then do it for a church family on a Sunday. Uh, Lord, I thank you for uh, the soup ministry yesterday and the fact that we were able to give out 168 quarts of soup um, with no strings attached other than getting uh, 30 or 40 prayer requests that we get to pray for. Uh, Lord, I thank you for um, my predecessor, um, whom I love, Pastor Doug, uh, having a good uh, procedure uh, on Friday and that he's uh, feeling healthy and is with us today. Lord, I pray that this time, uh, as we talk, or as I talk, um, about attention and focus, would be beneficial to all the folks that are here, and ultimately would bring great glory uh, to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I don't know if you've ever felt this, but I feel like uh, today's sermon, I'm kind of uh, at some foreign land and trying to talk about something that I am aware of, kind of vaguely aware of, uh, but am not living in that situation uh, myself as much as I would like. And so please, uh, all the stuff that I'm about to say, uh, kind of keep that in mind, I guess. Um, you become what you pay attention to. You become what you pay attention to. Uh, I think it's no surprise to any of us uh, in a world of 2023 that there are an awful lot of things uh, vying for our attention. Attention is probably the most, more than your money, more even than your time. What you attend to with your brain and your heart is going to most dictate the person you are becoming. And yet, uh, there are an awful lot of distractions around us. Um, let me talk for a second about the problem, some of the problems with distraction. One way to think about distraction is that in Silicon Valley, they are paying uh, some of the world's brightest people a lot more money than any of us will ever see or deal with in our lives to basically steal your attention. The whole concept of social media is that there is an attention economy and every website, every app, everything that you might spend time with online is vying for your attention because your attention specifically equals revenue dollars for advertisement from those individuals. And so they are gunning, not necessarily straight for your money, but mainly for your attention. A second problem with attention is that a lack of attention, a lack of focus, uh, a distracted life does not lead to more, but actually leads to less productivity. Um, there's a category of people called knowledge workers. Now that seems like a fancy title. Basically what that means is anybody who kind of for their work or for their job sits in front of a computer and feels like they're doing something important, right? Um, in reality, uh, for knowledge workers, uh, because we, and I consider myself in that boat, <laughs> spend a lot of our time sending and receiving emails, sending and receiving texts, 
uh, the amount of distraction from one topic to the next uh, decreases, this is some kind of research, uh, a lack of, of productivity by 10% over a given year. In other words, one out of 10 hours that people doing that kind of work are spent just simply being distracted. Number three is that a lack of focus or distraction increases anxiety. This actually makes a lot of sense if you think about it. Uh, there's a lot of talk, and I've talked about it many times here, about the increasing anxiety in our world. The way anxiety works is that a thought comes up that's a, 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 a fear-based thought that says something like, we are afraid of something that's going to happen around us or to us or, or something going on. The problem with distraction is that for a lot of people, when that anxiety begins to surface, instead of dealing with or responding to or, or, or working through that anxious feeling, what happens is we instead, because of distraction, turn our attention to scrolling through Facebook, watching the latest YouTube video, doing more work, doing more house cleaning, doing more of all the distraction things that we have in front of us to avoid that anxious feeling that has surfaced in our hearts. Let me say uh, the last thing. Uh, I want to talk about distracted life, but I want to approach it from the other side for a second here. I'm going to make up a hypothetical experiment <laughs> where I have a completely enclosed, soundproof, sterile room with a desk and a chair, and I have the ability to lock each of you in that room individually for one hour. And all I provide for you, you have no technology, no internet access, all you get is a piece of paper and a pen. And your task for that hour is to write down on that piece of paper what precisely do you want your life to look like. If you could make up the best vision, if you could set up your life to be the most meaningful and awesome and, and greatest version of your life that you could possibly imagine, what would you write on that, on that little paper there? That's the, that's the question that I'm asking. I know for me, if I were to write on that paper, what my goal for my life would look like would include, would include making memories with my children where we laugh so hard that eventually tears are coming out of our eyes from laughter. One of my goals for my life would be that my wife would know that she is the one out of all others that I treasure. I would want my work not to just be work, but to be full of meaning that somehow is going to last and make an impact that goes way beyond my own experience here as a, as a pastor, that kind of thing. These are the kinds of things that I would love to see happen from my life. And the question I want us to put before our, ourselves today is where are we losing out on that kind of vision for our lives simply because we're distracted and we lack focus? Um, we're going to delve today into the story that uh, Juliana uh, read about Martha and Mary. And put very simply, <laughs> it's a story about one person who has focus and one person who's distracted. It's real short and it's real clear. So there's going to be no question at all about what, Jesus, what, what, what God is trying to say through this story in the Gospels. There's no question about that at all. The question is going to remain... How is this passage going to actually transform our lives if it, if it does so? And so in the passage today, uh, Jesus is, is walking around and he gets invited into, um, into Martha's house. And he, he's there as a guest and um, Martha welcomes him into her house. She's clearly the owner of the house. We're going to find out pretty quickly that Martha is a pretty type A, go-getter, list-making, make-it-happen, 
I'll take charge, get everything done that, I, that needs to get done kind of person. I'm not saying that any of y'all are out there like Martha, but I'm just guessing. It's a guess. Um, and Martha has a sister. In my, my head, I sort of picture her as something like a 1970s hippie kind of person. Um, that's not in the Bible. I'm just kind of guessing. It's just a picture. Uh, and Martha is sitting at the Lord's feet listening to his teaching. That's, that's her deal. She's just sitting there. We'll come back to Martha uh, at the end, but I want to focus for a while longer on, on, we'll come back to Mary, I want to focus on Martha. I knew I was going to do that. Um, but Martha was distracted with much serving. And so she went up to Jesus and she said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. I'm going to try to paint the picture for you of Martha uh, a little better. Like, what does this look like in her house? What does it look like to have Jesus come by? And, and what is she precisely doing? Um, I'm envisioning, uh, I remember a story uh, when Ben Glick went here. Uh, we all of a sudden, the last minute, decided to go over to their house for, for dinner or something. And he sent me a text. It was like a meme of his wife basically like chucking everything in the closet just because like company's coming over. None of you guys have ever done this, I'm sure. But it's like, okay, someone's coming over. What do we got to do to get this place ready? In our family, we have this joke. There's a YouTube video about a family who's having company come over. And they said, uh, the, the line was, we don't want to let them know that we sit. You know, so fluff those pillows, make everything look nice, you know, as if our house looks like no one ever even lived there, right? And so I'm envisioning uh, Martha, something like that situation. It's not so much that she's just getting ready to have someone over pop in some leftovers, you know, pull up the chairs, whatever. It's not that. She's going way, way overboard. She's distracted with much serving. She's got four pots on the, on the uh, stove. She's got three things in the oven. Two of them are getting burnt at any given time. Like, this is Martha's, Martha's deal. She's distracted with much serving. And so she says, um, Lord, <laughs> do you not care? Her first response, because she's overdoing herself, is, Jesus, clearly you don't care. Now, I'm guessing that there's some people in this room who have thought to themselves over the past year or month or possibly morning, God, you clearly don't care. Martha's response, because she's distracted with much serving, is she can't see the caring that Jesus actually is doing. She's blind to that, and she thinks that he doesn't care. Why doesn't he care? Because in Martha's mind, <laughs> look at my sister Mary. She's sitting around here like a lazy bum. What, what is she doing? She's doing jack squat. I'm over here. I'm not saying any of you have ever experienced this. I'm over here working my tail off, and she's just sitting there doing nothing. This just is not fair. That's, that's how Martha's feeling. She's distracted, and so what we learn already is two things about being distracted. One is, if you're distracted, then you think you're more likely to think that God doesn't care about you, which makes exact perfect sense as to why distracted people are more anxious, because anxious people fear the future. They don't see God's care into the future. The second thing about distracted people <laughs> is that they're always going to be critical of the lazy bums who are not doing anything. They're always going to be critical of the lazy bums. Um, so Martha says to Jesus, uh, you know, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. Right? Like, God, can't you get these other people involved to do something for me um, because I need help because clearly it's all about me. That's what Martha's saying. I want to say real clearly Jesus' response. Because um, Jesus is, as always, I say this here, if you're new here, my name's Luke, and every Sunday I'm going to say some version of Jesus is really awesome. Um, Jesus answered her. He said, Martha, Martha. It's a real big deal that he used her name twice, because every time in the Bible a name gets used twice, right? Like 
Samuel, Samuel, uh, different places, every time it's used twice, it's kind of like once for the name and then the second for like emphasis and intensity and, and tenderness. And so Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. See how her distraction has led her to, to, she doesn't even know what to focus on. And with a lack of focus, she's worried about every single thing that pops up. It's like whack-a-mole, you know? So it's like, oh, here's an anxiety. Oh, but what about this one over here? Oh, but what about, and she's just chasing around anxious thought after anxious thought after anxious thought. Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion that will not be taken away from her. <clears throat> Here's our, um, our question for today. Is like, what did it look like for Mary? What was she doing? Like, how was Mary's experience of this different than Martha's experience? Martha, we already talked about, she saw what needed to be done, and she was trying to do way more than that. And she was distracted, and it just wasn't going well. Mary somehow did this one thing. What did she do? Well, it said earlier, and I skipped over it, that Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet and listening to his teaching. Now, first off, in the Bible, always sitting at someone's feet means putting yourself under their authority. So what Mary was doing is she's submitting herself and saying, Jesus, you're the boss, and I'm not the boss. In some ways, I, I, I feel like that already rid her of that anxious feeling. But here's my question. Uh, I'm so curious, and I really, really wish I knew in this particular passage what it was that Jesus was teaching about. Right? All, all we have is that she was sitting at Lord's feet and listening to his teaching. That's all we get. What was the teaching? That's my question. And like so much in the Bible... Um, <laughs> God's word is complete and helpful in the form that it is in, but it does not always answer every question that we want to have at, a- answered in the way we want to. And so we don't know what precisely was being taught um, by Jesus to Mary while she's sitting at his feet. But here's what we do know, um, which is, in my mind, really, really, really awesome. <clears throat> Something that Jesus said at some point (laughs) affected Mary deeply. Somehow, while she submitted to him, sat under his his teaching, uh, and learned something, it changed her life drastically. And the reason we know that is because in John chapter 12, there's a really awesome story. You might be familiar with it, but you might have never tied these two things together. This is what I'm trying to do today. In John chapter 12, what happens is there's a story of Mary at Bethany anointing Jesus' feet. And as the passage describes, uh, Mary is there, uh, Jesus is there, he's about to go to the cross, and she has a jar of super, super, super expensive perfume. It describes it as being about a year's wages. And I don't know about you, but I get get confused in like all the denarii and all this kind of stuff from, from the Bible. So, like, let's just assume right now it's a $50,000 bottle of perfume. And Mary of Bethany is going to take a $50,000 bottle of perfume, and she's going to dump the whole thing out on Jesus. And she's going to use that to anoint his feet. And she's, in a sense, uh, doing a couple things there. One is she's getting him ready to go to the, to go to the cross um, to anoint him as the Messiah, Uh, king over all the universe. Um, In another sense, here's what I would say, is she's responding at some level to what she heard him teaching. Whatever that teaching was, somehow her response to that teaching is, you know what I need to do for Jesus is I need to take $50,000 bottle of perfume and pour it on his feet. And so at some level, the ultimate question for today is something like this. Which woman actually served Jesus? Which woman actually served Jesus? Or which one did something that that left a lasting, meaningful impression on this world? Because Martha, God bless her, and I don't think she was, was, was trying to do poorly, but there's no description of exactly what the meal was like, 
<laughs> we don't know the details of how clean her house was. We don't know any of that stuff. <laughs> but we know that Martha had the guts and the generosity and the like, almost like insanely strong response to Jesus to, to spend $50,000 and pour it on his feet. And the reason I <laughs> bring up all of this stuff is because I would argue, and this is the main point for today's sermon, so if you're a sermon note writing down person, um, attention on Jesus is the single one thing that has lasting and life-giving value. If you give your attention to Jesus, it is the one thing in the world that has lasting and life-giving value. Nothing else will last and be helpful in the way that attention to Jesus is. Not even giving money to Jesus, not even giving time to church, not even what seems like a good act of service on Martha's part, but it's attention to Jesus, first and foremost, that is the most lasting life-giving value out of anything you can do with all of your time. I'm going to guess, I I feel pretty sure, (laughs) that a bunch of you are sitting there and somewhere in your brain is something like, that's very easy for you to say, Pastor Luke. Um, And you put the pastor there because, like, that's part of my job. Like, I got to spend time with Jesus because I got to have something to say on Sunday uh, and and that kind of stuff. Um, And so if you're saying to yourself, like, you don't know my life, you don't know how busy I am, You don't know the kind of anxieties and worries of my stress of my job. You don't know my family dynamic. You don't know, you know, how much I got to work to get pay off this debt. Like whatever is that thought that's going in your mind that's saying, "There's here's my excuse for why I can't spend more time with Jesus." (laughs) I have two responses to every one of those thoughts. (laughs) The first response is this: (laughs) putting the word pastor in front of my name (laughs) does not particularly make this any different for me than it does for y'all. In fact, I would argue it makes it more complex because now I have a hard time knowing when my spending time with Jesus is related to my work or when it is because he's Jesus and he's worth spending time with. But the second thing that's way more important is that I think this is at heart a gospel issue. I think it is at heart a gospel issue. And if you believe in the gospel, then attention to Jesus is the single one thing that has lasting life-giving value. Let me try to explain it this way. I talked a couple weeks ago about religion around here, and I said that the problem with religion is that religion is always us trying to earn our way up to God. That's the view of religion. It says, what can I do? How much can I do? to God, have God finally like me. And I think even for people who go to church a lot, we still struggle with that thing because in church we say, read your Bible and pray. And, and so now we think, here's this other set of things. As long as I do them, then I'll reach up to God. But that's religion. It's not the gospel. And so in a very clear way today, I think in our passage, Martha is trying to get her house ready for Jesus by doing as much as she possibly can to make sure Jesus will like what she did at her house. And so she's kind of epitomizing this concept of religion. But that is not the gospel. The gospel is simply this, um, that because God loves you, he's like a huge fan of you and wants you to be flourishing and healthy and good. Because of that, uh, I imagine Jesus at some level, and this I know is there's no verse for this, but I imagine Jesus like in heaven kind of like, God, like, please let me go down and help them. Like, I want to help them. I want their good. Can I, can I please go? And God sends him to go, and Jesus comes down to earth, and he lives perfectly. He has this whole encounter with Mary and Martha, and then eventually uh, he's in the garden, you know, and he doesn't want to go to the cross, um, but he does, and he gets beat and bruised and nailed to the cross and all that kind of stuff. And the main thing I want to tell you today is that as all that's going on, Jesus' attention is on you. 
the gospel says that God so loved you that, like, so loved you. And, and you, you can't love, this is an aside a little bit, but you can't love somebody without putting your attention on them. Right? Like, newsflash, if any of you are out there trying to date somebody, like, when you're trying to, to date them, give them your attention. Like, we all know this is the case. And if we say God loves us, then what that means is that he gave his attention to you. He took his suffering because he wanted to attend to your good. And so, I know I'm getting ahead of myself to Good Friday, Easter, all that stuff, it's coming. But the only reason why there's, however many of us there are, 200 and some people together in this room, on a Sunday morning, worshiping God, is not because our worship, Matt, it's because our worship is in response to the attention God gave to us first. And the beauty of this whole thing, then, is that if God's attention on us is what allows us to spend eternity in glory with him, then when we spend eternity with glory in him, and I encourage you to read the book of Revelation, a lot of people read the book of Revelation, and their, their goal is to, like, figure out the detailed timeline of things, and I'm not saying that that stuff's not in there, but the main point of Revelation always is that eternity is going to be awesome glorifying Christ. It's not going to be like a, a selfish personal party for you, and if you have that vision of eternity with God, it's kind of like you somehow missed out on the whole gospel, right? It's not just about your life being awesome, it's about your life being awesome because the best, most awesome life is giving attention to God, to Jesus for what he has done for us. We're left with a couple questions. Uh, one question we're left with today is this. Um, did Martha change? Again, the Bible gives us absolutely no answer. It's so annoying. Because it's like, Jesus tells her this thing, you know, focus on one thing, don't get distracted, don't have all this anxiety. What are you going to do? And we don't know. And I think that only leads to one possible solution, which is we're left wondering what are we going to do about that. If you're feeling distracted and anxious, what are you going to do? We don't know what happened with Martha, what's going to happen with you, what's going to happen with me. Remember, I'm an, I'm an outsider speaking <laughs> into this situation. I'm not saying I have it all put together. Um, if the gospel is true, and we're going to spend eternity, like the book of Revelation describes, glorifying, praising, holy, holy, holy is the lamb that was slain for us, because he gave his attention to us, and we're going to spend forever giving our, our, our worship back to him. And worship is just another way to say our attention. Um, the question I want to ask for you then is why not just start now? Like if that's going to be the best thing that we do forever and ever and ever in the future, and we describe that as perfection, <laughs> why don't we start sooner? Like we can, you know, why wouldn't we? And so to that point, uh, I've got a list of applications today that's kind of a mile long. Um, I'm going to go through some of these. Uh, I hope this is helpful for you. Um, I hope it's not. The gospel is always meant to be life-giving, not soul-deadening. And so I wrote this list with the idea of not saying God's only going to love you if you spend you know, one hour every morning giving your attention to him. But I think if you spend one hour every morning giving your attention to him, you're going to really know he loves you. That kind of thing. All right, let's go through our list. <clears throat> Number one, are you critical of others for not helping? If you, if you are in the Martha situation, if you're distracted with much serving, and let's be honest here, um, I try to just tell the truth, even though... Uh, <laughs> Some things are weird to say. Uh, churches, the, the data everyone always gives is that 20% of the people do 80% of the work in churches. I don't know where those numbers precisely came from, but I heard that like a thousand times. So the question is, if you're one of those 20%, um, and I say God bless you, but if you're in the 20% and you're critical of all those other 80%, then as, in a certain sense, you're the Martha in this situation. And what you're trying to do is boost yourself up and say, God, you need to care more for me because I'm doing all the work and these other lazy bums aren't doing anything. Number two, uh, scripture before phone. I debated how much to talk about technology and phones in this. I feel personally, um, 
and I don't think it's a generational thing. I know young people struggle with their phones. I know that for sure, a thousand percent. But I've encountered enough folks in their 50s, 60s, and 70s who spend, you know, boatloads of time on Facebook or wherever, or whatever, whatever. And I'm not saying that all that is inherently, let me make sure I get my words right here. I think we need to be very, very, very careful because those platforms in some ways are seeking to steal our attention. And so uh, a phrase that may be helpful for you, and I've been employing this for the past while, is scripture before phone. Um, there's some data, and I won't go into all the particulars because I ain't, ain't got time. There's some data that says, basically, whatever you put your attention to first thing in the morning and the last thing before you go to bed, more than any other time in your day, forms you into the person you're becoming. And so if, when you wake up, the very first thing you do is grab that phone and see who texts or what's happened on social media or whatever, I would argue that you're being formed more by the phone than you are by the Savior. Same thing at night. If that's the last thing on your brain, um, there's a lot, of, a lot of data. 2013 is when most teenagers got cell phones. It's precisely the same year that anxiety and depression skyrocketed, right? We've talked, I've talked before about the pornography issues. Like, there's so many issues related to this thing, and I'm going to push... You may not like it, but I'm going to push for more thoughtfulness and intentionality in how you deal with your phone. Because the, the problem with phones is that while this same problem used to happen on TV, you weren't carrying the TV around with you in your pocket every single place you went. And that's what makes it insanely different. You become what you pay attention to. Uh, number three, uh, seek ye first, you might know the verse, it's in Matthew chapter 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you as well. Here's, here's the point. Some of you, if I can try to get in your brain again, are saying something like, well, that sounds really good and all, but like, I still have to go to work. Like, I don't have all this time to spend paying attention to Jesus because I have a family and I have to go to work and I got to change the kid's diaper and I got all these kinds of things. And what I'm saying is that I think it's about a hierarchy and if you don't pay attention to Jesus first and foremost, your hierarchy gets, gets out of whack. And when that happens, <laughs> your time with your family, your time with your spouse, your time at work, your time for recreation, all of those things are negatively influenced. However, <laughs> if you pay attention to Jesus first and foremost, what is most tremendous about that is that's going to impact or influence how you think about Right? The godly vision of marriage, the godly vision of child raising, the godly vision of work, the godly vision of all those things, it helps to heal your relationship with everything else below it. And so what I'm not saying is, go ahead and live in the desert and pay attention to Jesus all the time and who cares about the rest of your life? I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is, if you pay attention to Jesus first and foremost, everything else will correctly fall into place underneath that. And you'll actually be amazed at how helpful that is in every other area of your life. Um, number four, what's your expensive bottle of perfume? I said earlier that my vision for my life is, I, like, I want to make some impact that lasts beyond me. That's not just, like, you know, something centered on me as a person. <laughs> Mary took $50,000 bottle of perfume, poured it on Jesus' feet, and we read about it and think about it all over the world. 2,000 years later. What in your life is the thing that God might be calling you to focus on? Because when you focus on something, when you put your attention to like one thing, it doesn't get diluted and the impact is magnified tons and tons over versus the distracted kind of life. And so I encourage you to process what is your expensive bottle of perfume. Number five, what is your distraction and why? Um, I'll just speak for myself. You can apply this to your own life if it's helpful. <laughs> One of the things that I learned is that when I'm anxious, when I'm not doing well, this kind of thing, <laughs> I'll watch like hunting videos on YouTube. I know it sounds like not spiritual. I mean, it's, it's unhealthy because it's an avoidance mechanism. It's not that watching hunting videos on YouTube are inherently bad, nothing like that. But what I'm doing in that moment <laughs> is I'm avoiding the real actual challenges of my life 
And I'm just trying to fulfill that with an easy, distracting, you know, solution in my head. <laughs> but it doesn't actually solve the problem. And so when I'm done with that, that problem is still hanging out right there. And so I would encourage you to think through, and everybody's different. So for some people, I think for a lot of us, it's probably our phones, even if we don't agree to that. But for other people, maybe your distraction is work, right? So anytime something's causing you a problem, this is guys a lot of times who, you know, they're never home because they're always at work. Why? Actually, maybe because they don't know how to deal with life at home. So they distract themselves with work, which looks good to a lot of other people. It's actually not. Everybody has, some people it's cleaning, you know, kind of OCD level, like, okay, I don't know what to do in this world. Let me clean something. Right? And I'm not saying that that's always inherently bad, but understand yourself. If we don't understand ourselves, we're never going to have God work in our lives. Sorry to make everybody look at each other at that one. <laughs> uh, last thing, and I'm done, is prayer. Um, for me, I've been growing through uh, what you might describe, of, describe as listening prayer. Listening prayer is basically something like uh, coming before God, paying attention to him, and asking him to communicate to you and trying to listen. Um, I don't know that I hear like a precise audible voice, but oftentimes that adds to clarity or a passage or a scripture or something that shows me like this is what God's communicating to me. This is who God is to me. What does it look like for me to sit at Jesus' feet to say, I'm going to submit myself to your authority. You teach me what you want to teach me and use that as the thing that's going to trickle down then into the rest of my life and how I, how I live it otherwise. And so as we always end this whole sermon series, uh, I'm going to invite anybody who wants to to come up and pray. Uh, if you want to pray that you can kind of refocus, uh, in my younger days, people in churches called it rededicate their lives to Christ, kind of refocus your attention back on to Jesus. Um, you're more than welcome at the end to come up and pray here or somebody can come pray with you. Uh, if you want to just come up on your own and just pray in silence and just like say, God, I want to hear from you, um, whatever, whatever is helpful for you, uh, we here at Kish uh, love you and want your good uh, because I think mainly we're just trying to represent God who loves you and wants your good. So would you please close in prayer with me? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I thank you for these individuals. Um, I thank you that you, uh, you created us, even in our complexity. Uh, you have, have kind of shown us what is good to pay attention to. I think of that Hebrews passage that P.D. loves so much, uh, fix our eyes on Jesus. And I just pray, Lord, for those who are here who are maybe feeling like this is just a bridge too far or this is not, you know, I ain't got time. Um, I have too much going on. Um, I don't know how to uh, pay attention to Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you would just inspire them um, to, to read the scripture and to, um, and to focus on you, to listen to what you have to say. I pray, Lord, that you would help me um, as somebody who's fumbling around uh, working in this area um, but has certainly not arrived, that you would help me to um, kind of do the hard work of not identifying myself in much distraction with serving um, and sit and hang out at your feet. Um, let you give us the resources that we need so that we can serve out of abundance um, and out of joy, uh, not being critical of others, um, but wanting their good as well. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.